Thank you, Owen, and bonjour. <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. In 1925, Martin Coles Harmon, an English businessman, purchased Lundy Island from the British government. And four years later, he declared himself to be King of Lundy and issued his own currency. It consisted of a penny-sized coin and a halfpenny-sized coin. I apologize if some of you aren't old enough to know what a halfpenny is. These coins were the same size as the British coins of the realm, and they nominally passed on the island with the same value. The islanders loved it. They trusted Mr. Harmon. He had plenty of money. He just bought the country after all. But the British government didn't like it. They didn't like anyone usurping the function of the issuer of the coin of the realm. They prosecuted Mr. Harmon. After lengthy court proceedings, which went through the British system from the bottom to the top, he was fined five pounds. But as usual, the lawyers made more out of it than the government did, and he was ordered to pay lawyers' costs of 15 guineas. He stopped issuing the coins, and they became collector's items. I have one of each, and they're beautiful. Governments don't like people taking over the issuing of currency. It's one of the things that they regard as their own prerogative. There was a time when issuing of currency was the issuing of promises backed by some sort of physical asset that had value. Gold standard, silver standard in the United States. Today we have what I think is a very quaint and extraordinary situation on the Isle of Man where we issue our own paper currency and it passes because people believe that if I take a 20 pound note from Mr. A, I can go and buy 20 pounds worth of something from Mr. B and everyone will accept that note. And those Isle of Man notes are given value and credibility by the Isle of Man government maintaining a strong box in the Bank of England, which is filled with the exact same amount of currency that's been issued on the Isle of Man in British notes which themselves are guaranteed by the Bank of England, which promises to pay the bearer on demand. But the Bank of England's promises are only as strong as the Bank of England, and England is only as strong as people's belief. There's nothing behind currency today except a belief system. And that, I believe, is what has permitted digital currency to suddenly come onto the market. We've probably all been to conferences about change. We've talked about the pace of change, the fact that it is exponentially ratcheting up. It took thousands of years to invent the first airplane. It took no time at all to go from the propeller engine to the jet engine. And it took even less time to get from the jet engine to large passenger aircraft. Something that was unimaginable in 1901 was regarded as just another way of getting to the beach in Spain by 2001. And so it is with cryptocurrency, ladies and gentlemen. The seminal paper that proposed the idea of a decentralized digital economy was only published in 2008. It was written, apparently, by a Japanese mathematician called Satoshi Nakamoto, who doesn't exist. It's widely believed that at most three or four mathematicians, probably from MIT or some other university institution in the States, were involved in producing this paper. And it was made anonymous for exactly the same reason that Martin Coles Harmon was prosecuted in 1929. They believed that governments would regard this proposition as subversive and would possibly pursue them. And if they were Americans, of course, being pursued by the government, is a particularly bad thing. I'm going to assume that not everyone in the room has considered what cryptocurrency is or how it's made. And just do a little bit of 1.0 instruction before we go into talking about some of the issues for the Isle of Man. But before I do that, let me ask you a question. I don't want anyone to stand up, but I would like you to raise your arm boldly and show me if you own any Bitcoins today. So we've got about 12 people. What about if you own any other cryptocurrency besides Bitcoin? So more or less the same number. Bitcoin is only one of many, many different cryptocurrencies there are out there today. But it's the most prominent one, and it's the one that's had the most press so far. 
So we'll talk a little bit about Bitcoins. Bitcoins are created or mined by using computing power to solve complex mathematical equations. A miner, and there are at least two miners in the room with us here today who are mining on the Isle of Man, is rewarded by using computer power, which includes electrical power, to solve those equations. And every 10 minutes, another 25 bitcoins are created and released onto the ecosystem. In a way, it could be said that bitcoins are a commodity, like machine code. If you develop a piece of software and you protect your intellectual property in that software, you can sell it to people. Of course, you can sell the same software to many, many different people. But because of the existence of a security protocol known as the blockchain, which is replicated across tens of thousands of computers, a bit like the way supercomputers can be created using the power of many, many different personal computers. You can't replicate a Bitcoin. It's created once, and it's a unique string of code. Only 21 million and change Bitcoins will ever be created, and the amount of computing power used to create Bitcoins progressively increases as the sums get higher and higher. At the present rate of mining, if everything stays stable, there will be no more Bitcoins mined after the year 2041, 2041. At that point, there will be a finite number of Bitcoins in circulation, but they are broken down into eight decimal places, and each unit is known as a Satoshi. So there's lots of ability in the system at present for a Bitcoin, which could be relatively expensive, today they're around 350 pounds, to be broken down into many, many units and to be used for microtransactions. <coughs> if this works, if Bitcoin or any other virtual currency becomes a de facto standard and secures widespread adoption, the possible advantages from it are massive. First of all, it's borderless. Because bitcoins or other cryptocurrencies are transferred between personal devices using the internet as a medium, then you don't need to go to a bank in Douglas and buy foreign currency to send a payment. You don't have to use wire transfers. You don't need to use your credit cards. You can simply send using the internet or today, using the text messaging system, a payment to someone else who believes that payment has value and will release a good or service to you. If there is a winner in the race to be the currency of choice, or if there are stable exchange mechanisms established between a handful of cryptocurrencies, then currency exchange issues are resolved as well. A Bitcoin is worth a certain amount of money here, and it's worth the same amount in Australia, or Vietnam, or China, or the US. For me, as a payment processor, because I do most of my work in the payment processing and banking field, the key attraction of a digital currency system like this is the lowering of costs. When you buy something with your Visa or MasterCard, typically the merchant suffers a discount, on a credit card, it's somewhere between 2 and 6%, depending on the brand. On a debit card, it's typically 20 or 22 pence. That may not seem like a big deal, but if you're Amazon and you have sales which are bigger than the gross national product of Germany in a year, and 3% of that is going to Visa and MasterCard, it's a huge number with a lot of zeros after it. But consider the other end of the spectrum. If you're a band producing music, and you want to sell your songs for 99 cents as downloads. 99 cents US, about 60 pence British, and if you have a really good deal with Lloyds or HSBC or Barclays for processing the debit cards, you might get away with paying 22 pence per debit card transaction. That's a 33% loss on your turnover. By contrast, paying with a digital currency, which is becoming increasingly possible, is likely to cost you a fraction of a cent for a transaction, and as the merchant, there are huge fractions in that. The other issue is speed. I had a client last week that owed me around 3,800 pounds on an invoice. 
He went to his bank in the US, he sent a wire transfer, and three days later he asked why I hadn't performed the service. I said, well, with new clients, we don't actually do anything until the money comes in. And his response was, why don't you take Bitcoin? Because if I'd taken payment in Bitcoin, I would have had the money about 20 minutes later at maximum, and possibly one or two minutes later. Those are some of the attractions. There are issues as well, and because there is opposition, and because people love bad press, and they like to suck in between their teeth and think about all the negative implications, of course the bad things get a lot more play than the good. So let's deal with some of those issues. One of them is theft. If you have a digital wallet or a device which carries your digital currency, you're at risk of losing that device, of throwing it away, there are prominent cases that have been reported in the press of people throwing away an old computer and forgetting that their hard drive had the private key to their wallet on it and losing access to a large amount of digital currency. <coughs> MT Gox, the Japanese exchange which famously failed, lost a vast amount of coins, apparently, I'm not so sure, and then later issued a press release saying that it had found an old key and managed to unlock 200,000 bitcoins that it had mysteriously found. This is not a fatal problem. Everywhere that you move in the internet world today, you need to be able to protect the security and look after your assets. It's no different than not leaving your wallet on the car seat with the window open. Although in Douglas, of course, you wouldn't lose it anyway. Another issue is volatility. Critics of Bitcoin and its friends are very, very happy to point to the fact that the currency has seesawed up and down. There's no denying this. Of course, currencies go up and down as well. Sometimes they react wildly. So again, it's not a criticism of Bitcoin itself to say that it goes up and down in value in response to world events. So does the US dollar, so does the pound. It's not as wild, but this is a new system it's not been around that long. And today, there are plenty of companies who are working on routines, algorithms, and methodologies, A, to allow people to hedge the value of Bitcoin that they may hold, and B, to even out the rise and fall in the market. A derivatives market is growing. The world's largest derivatives trader for Bitcoin is presently in the process of establishing itself on the Isle of Man after taking the strategic decision to move from Hong Kong. Speculation is an issue, and even within the Bitcoin Foundation and the people who are closest to wanting this to work, there are warnings that there is the risk of a speculative bubble. When a large department store in China announced that it would take Bitcoin for purchases, the price of Bitcoin rose by about 30%. When the Chinese government announced that it would not permit Chinese banks to carry accounts for Bitcoin companies, the price fell by about 30% as well. Definitely there is speculation. Definitely there is investment. In fact, the latest estimates suggest that about 70% of all Bitcoins are presently held for speculative purposes rather than for trading purposes. But then again, what percentage of money in the world is held by people who are investing or speculating as opposed to actually buying and selling things? It's about the same. Money laundering raises its ugly head. Here in the Isle of Man, we have a profound reputation for being ahead of the curve with money laundering, with anti-money laundering, with KYC, with anti-terrorist financial sorry, anti-terrorist financing principles. We're good at this, and we want to keep it this way. The fact that a digital currency could be used for money laundering is not a reason not to have a digital currency. It's a reason not to have cash. The primary vehicle of choice for money launderers, smugglers, criminals, bad eggs everywhere is cash. And if we were serious, if we were really truly serious, about getting all the potential for laundering the proceeds of crime off the Isle of Man, the place we would start is with the cash, not with digital currency. It's a minor player. I've kept using the word currency, and that raises an issue. 
a representative of the government here the other day told me the government has had legal advice that digital currency is not a currency, therefore I shouldn't call it a currency. Of course, this is a circular argument. Depending on which definition of currency you choose, either it is or it isn't. But it doesn't really matter. If we call it a store of value, if we call it a medium of exchange, the choice of terminology may lead us down some blind alleys in FSC regulation. But it doesn't change the fact that you can use Bitcoin and other digital currencies to buy things, to sell stuff, to invest, to speculate, just like you would with a lot of other currencies. I've kept saying Bitcoin and its friends. I'd like to ask you, can anybody name any other digital currencies that are out there at the moment? Go ahead. Dogecoin. Dogecoin, or however you pronounce it. I've heard it pronounced Doggy Coin, Dogecoin. I just don't know. That's one of the leaders. Any other offers? Litecoin. Next coin I heard down here. Ripple. Ripple. Any others? All right. Let's have an auction. How many <laughs> digital currencies do you think are alive and operating in the world today? Any offers? Over 200 is a good start, and you're correct. 460, I think, is a little on the high side. I, tr I tried my best to get a number yesterday, and I came up with 329. How many, many government-issued currencies are there in the world today? Take a guess. 196. Not far off, somewhere between 170 and 200, depending on how you, how you determine them. So today, there are about twice as many wannabe or Me Too digital currencies in the world as there are actual currencies. It goes without saying that there's going to be some thinning out, there are going to be some more entrants, and there are going to be some that die. But given that level of activity, the number of digital currencies that are out there, I think it's clear that the concept is here to stay. It's not going to fail. I don't know if Bitcoin will be the winner or if something else will come along. Another question for you. Would you like to estimate how much venture capital is available today from credible VC firms to be invested into digital currency technology? I'll give you a clue that it's bigger than the budget of the Isle of Man. That's it, 1.4 billion. Uh, no, that, <laughs> not quite up there. I'm talking about loose cash, money that's been allocated but not given to a particular company yet, VC money. 300 million, on the nose, absolutely. 300 million dollars out there waiting to be invested. Mr. Shimon, we like some of that here on the island, wouldn't we? In fact, it will pay the national debt, wouldn't it? <laughs> now, I thought you might like to know a little bit about where all this started, and I mentioned this mainly because it's illustrative of how quickly things can move. Looking back at the history of any kind of relationship between Bitcoin and the Isle of Man, the earliest date that I can find is June 2013. Many of you will know Garth Kimber. Garth was formerly the head of e-gaming development at DED, and his job was to bring gaming companies to the island, which he did very successfully for a number of years. Garth brought a couple of friends to my house. They had an idea. They wanted to set up a Bitcoin exchange on the Isle of Man, and they were stuck for payment processing. They didn't know how to process their payments. I'd never heard of it, but I thought it was an interesting proposition, and I got stuck in a little bit and, and tried to look at ways that payments could be processed. I came to the conclusion that at that time, it was probably going to be easier to do it in the UK than it was in the Isle of Man. And I wrote on their behalf to the Financial Conduct Authority, the FCA in the UK, laid out the proposition as to what the digital currency exchange was going to be and asked for a ruling. And as a model for users of regulatory services, in the UK there's a service level agreement for answers from the FCA and it's five business days. Three business days later, the FCA issued a written ruling saying that the Bitcoin exchange, as we had proposed it, could operate in the UK and that there will be no requirement of registration with them 
or with customs and excise. So we got things rolling along. But it didn't quite work very well in the UK, and, and for reasons really nothing to do with the regulation or the regulatory environment. It's more to do with that particular company. And in March of this year, so just three months ago, we took a second look at whether it will be, whether it will be possible to set that company up on the Isle of Man. And I decided to make the same approach, and I wrote to the FSC here. Now, historically, the FSC here has been famous for not really committing itself, for kind of sitting on the fence and saying, take legal advice with the implication that if you get the wrong legal advice, you might get prosecuted anyway. They didn't. The, FC, the FSC here, stunningly, wrote back to me within less than a week and said, as you put this proposition, Mr. Davis, you can do this on the Isle of Man. We have no objection. You won't breach any of our requirements, and you won't be required to be regulated here. I published that opinion. There was no restriction on my sharing it with other people. And it hit the internet like a virus because all over the world there were budding companies in the Bitcoin space looking for a place to come call home and a place where they could operate freely without fear of being shut down by jealous governments or jealous banking sectors. So that was March. March the 26th that, issue, that ruling was issued. And by April 1st, about 50 people from the island gathered in the Viking in Castletown and we formed the Manx Digital Currency Association. Again, stunningly, it was welcomed by the FSC who were very happy to have a professional body from whom they could take advice. This was new stuff work. It was welcomed by the government, which has a long tradition here of working closely with industry bodies and seeking to promote business in a parallel venture between the private sector and the public sector. Fast forward now, just two months, to the 10th of June, when the Isle of Man government issued its own official statement on digital currency policy, and it said, if you're a good actor in this space, if you don't want to harm the public, if you're not looking to launder money, and if you're not a threat to our island's reputation, you are welcome here. We want you on your shores. Bring your jobs. Bring your technical development. Bring your venture capital. Bring your people. The Isle of Man is friendly and sees the opportunity in the forwarding of digital currency. I'm waiting for the banking sector to come out with something that is as helpful as that. It's not here yet. The banking sector, despite the FSC's apparent openness to consider digital currency and to look favorably upon the development in the island, the banking sector is still terrified of the FSC. The FSC has extraordinary powers to withdraw licenses, discipline banks, and so on and so forth. And it will take the banks a long time to realize that they can take risk on Bitcoin businesses without fear from the FSC. A dialogue is needed, but I believe that it will come because so many people are making the right noises, and so many of our institutions on the island are looking at this as a business opportunity. I could have dined out lunch and dinner every day for the last month on financial institutions who wanted to talk to me about this and get a good understanding of what's going on. So that's all very positive. Where are the opportunities for the Isle of Man? We're already seeing exchanges setting up here. They have clear direction from the FSC as to how they can do their business and what they're required to do. Software development is an area which has lots of potential. But those of you who have techni technological businesses will acknowledge that there's somewhat of a dearth of talent on the island for software development. Never mind. If a development company wants to come here and feels this is the place to be, I have word from the government that they will make those work permits available. They will make it seamless and easy for people to come to the island to work, earn money, and spend it in the island shops and bars. No problem. Mining is an attractive opportunity for the island for two reasons. First of all, we have an abundant power supply. I believe that about 1% of the island's output of electrical power is already being consumed 
to mine digital currency. That could be 5% with very little effort. And the other reason is the weather. When we compare the Isle of Man to other jurisdictions, generally speaking, the weather is held out as a bit of a disadvantage. It's hard to see why today. But actually, it's cool here. And one of the major costs, if you're a hosting center, if you're a mining operation, is the cost of cooling to keep those supercomputers from overheating. So when we compare with Malta or even the Channel Islands, there's a significant reduction in cooling costs on the island. We also have the equipment here. We have four or five top class hosting centers, and we have a good supply chain for hardware, so no issues there. The real opportunity, though, I believe, not to be in the current state of Bitcoin, but in the technology. We're only beginning to see, as we were when the Wright brothers first took flight for those 60 or 70 seconds, we're only beginning to see what can be done with blockchain technology. The ability to build on that for security protocols, for computing protocols, for commerce, for industry, for banking, is extraordinary. I don't know how many companies there are out there building new products to go onto, onto the blockchain. But for instance, intellectual property can be attached to tiny fractions of a Bitcoin. And you can transfer the fraction with a song or a play or a book on it in place of physically shipping or electronically downloading that piece of technology for consumer use. The possibilities are beyond any of our comprehension, as they have been in so many other fast-moving areas of development. I'd like, before I close, to just say a few words about the relationship between digital currency and gaming. Internet gaming, as you know, is a major, major part of the of man's digital economy. In fact, it's a major part of our economy generally. And one of the challenges that gaming companies face is the ability to take deposits for play from countries which have closed currency systems, closed loop systems, difficult exchange rates, and so on and so forth. You'll have jumped ahead of me now. You'll have realized that conveyance of a digital currency to a gaming company jumps over all those fences and gets value into the hands of the operator. But there's a problem. Here on the island, we're very, very good at protecting players' money. And when a gaming company receives a deposit, it's required immediately to put those player funds into a protected bank account, normally on the Isle of Man, or make some other arrangement that protects the player from loss of his funds in the event the company goes under. Now, there ain't no bank on the Isle of Man that will take deposits in Bitcoin or Dogecoin or Nextcoin or any of those coins at the moment. That could change Standard Bank in South Africa is looking at it, and a couple of other banks in the United States have recently announced the ability to deposit Bitcoins with them. The US Post Office is examining the possibility. It needs something to shore up its P&L because it's losing money. And the UK Post Office has recently commenced talks about possibly operating as a digital wallet in the UK. But in the meantime, a bridge product is required. And a company called GoCoin, in Santa Monica in California, has developed a tie-in between an exchange where people buy and sell Bitcoins and gaming deposits. So it's a pretty simple proposition. A person goes onto PokerStar's site and says, I want to deposit $100, but I want to do it using Bitcoin. He clicks on GoCoin's icon. GoCoin processes the transaction, tells the player how much Bitcoin to send. The Bitcoins are sent. GoCoin puts them into the exchange and sells them, and PokerStars is immediately credited with the corresponding value. Result, PokerStars gets $100. It can fulfill its prudential requirements. GoCoin takes and sells the Bitcoin instantly, and they're not exposed to any risk either. GoCoin, uh, a few days ago, made the decision to acquire the Manx Broadcasting Corporation, a long-established institution on the island, in order to bring the entire of its business to the Isle of Man. I'd like to ask you, who, because there are many CSPs, lawyers, accountants in the room, who among you, nice bold show of hands again please, is presently negotiating with or has been approached by 
a digital currency business to come here. Wow. Look at that. Do you know how many foreign companies are presently looking at moving their operations to the island as a result of our announcements? Do I have any suggestions? Okay, I'll make one. As far as I can tell, it's north of 60. 60 companies looking, as we sit here, at moving to the Isle of Man, even if they only bring one job each. That's significant, but they'll bring a lot more. And I'll close this section with a rhetorical question. I'm not looking for answers. Who knows, outside e-gaming, what other opportunities could come to the island as a result of us having a developed ecosystem for digital currencies? And now in closing, I'm going to ask myself a question. People say to me, Paul, why are you doing all this? Because I'm not earning any fees. The company for which I'm house counsel actually doesn't process for Bitcoin or any other digital currency. And in fact, it represents a threat to the very fabric of the company that pays my salary. If Bitcoin took over the world, we as a payment processor would probably have nothing to do and I wouldn't have a job. Well, the answer is, first of all, I don't believe that Bitcoin is going to take over the world. It's going to take its place, I believe, alongside other inventions and other protocols which make e-commerce valid and vibrant and important. But the reason I've taken this by the horns, the reason I've worked rather tirelessly, I might say, with government, with friends in the private sector and with the association to try to make this happen is that I love the Isle of Man. I moved here in 2009. The island has done well for me. My wife is ecstatically happy living here, and she's from Brazil, which is a big change. My kids are happy in two great schools here, and the business and government environments here are the friendliest I've ever experienced. And I've lived in the UK, Canada, Singapore, Indonesia, Mexico, and Ireland. This is the best place in the world to do business, and I believe this is the best opportunity that's come to our shores since e-gaming took a look at us in 2001. Thank you for listening. I'll be very glad to take questions.